Hi, and welcome to Comic Industry Insiders, where our goal is to get to know the people behind the scenes of the comic book industry and to uncover the secrets that will help you understand and grow your own business or career in comics. My name is Adam Freeman, and yes, I do spell it that way, of prominent direct market solutions. Our guest today is Ku Yu Lang. Ku is a broker, advisor, and consultant to businesses worldwide with a passion for comics and the geek space culture. He was the VP of Sales, Marketing, and Business Development for Diamond Book Distributors, the book market arm of Diamond Comics Distribution, and the Director of Global Business Development for Repop, the promoters of New York Comic Con, Emerald City Comic Con, and more. Through his career, he's had experience in retail, distribution, publishing, and events. A true renaissance man and exactly the kind of operator in comics we started this podcast to highlight. Koo brought us lessons in the value of hand sellers, the value of networking and getting to know the people you do business with, and the best time to sell your business. This was an incredibly fun conversation that I learned a ton from, and I really hope you do too. And now, Koo Yu Lang. But how are you? Uh, where are you in the world right now, this beautiful office of yours? I am in beautiful Seattle, Washington. So. Seattle, Washington. That's yeah. right. How long have you lived there? 19 years. Excellent. 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 Um, and what, uh, well, you know what? I'm not going to do that. Let's actually go backwards. You started <laughs> off uh, uh, apparently working at the Central Park Bookstore in San Mateo, California. Is that right? That is accurate. Um, I'm, I'm, my, my genius uh, um, researcher tells me this was 1985, right? Is that, is that where you started? Sure. <laughs> I can't, can't remember the year. Um, I do think I was 15 years old or something like that, or 16, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Just looking for a part time job? Yeah, my friend was, uh, you know, I was in high school. My mm -hmm. friend was actually working in the cafe part of this bookstore. Okay. So I, I actually got a job working in the cafe. And then I remember the owner came to me one time. It's like, hey, we're looking for somebody to help out on the bookstore side. Have you ever sold books before? <laughs> um, so there started my first lie of many lies. I sure, I sold books. <laughs> yeah, I sold books all the time. I'm right, a and I ended up kid. working. Right, and then <laughs> ended up working at the bookstore for five years. Eventually became the buyer. And then from there, I was recruited to join Random House. So that bookstore was really the start of working for other people because I used yeah. to work my dad but I don't think that counts what did your dad do? my dad did lots of things um, sure in, in, we came from Taiwan in America he owned <laughs> you might remember this remember you used those one hour Photoshop you can develop your film in one hour so oh, I sure. developed film yeah and then he opened a video rental store so I ran that um, okay teenager yeah and then we did some food stuff he owned restaurants and stuff so man yeah so oh, uh, living in a video rental store i mean you yeah. know that was like living in literally in the future where you had access to all the movies all the time right uh it was amazing yeah i watched <laughs> everything <laughs> <laughs> you know it occurs to me i actually have this thing up in my office that is uh watchmen and dark knight returns oh yeah this yeah. is a uh, an early pop uh piece that they put out uh, both published in 1985, and your first books, your your first gig apparently 1985. It's a magical year. <laughs> so you uh, so you're working in the bookstore, right? And right. you get how, so how did you end up working at, at PRH? Was it because of that? Yeah. So one of my job was to meet with a book publisher who will come in try to pitch the books to us, right? Right. So all the different book publisher. Or come to our bookstore because the bookstore was pretty successful it was a very large bookstore kind of a prototype of today's see this day and age a lot of bookstores have cafes have little merchandise maybe a little flower shop but by then at the, back in 1985 we were the first one like no one else had ever done this at least in the san francisco bay area can speak right. for the entire world so and you know, to, to make a long story short at some so at some point i was offered a job by Random House to be a sales assistant, not a sales mm. rep. I don't get to sell books. This this was pre-computers. So okay. my job was to go into other bookstore and physically count the books every month. <laughs> so you would be like, 
Last month you had three copies of Watchmen. This month mm-hmm. you have two. You must have sold one. <laughs> That's how it was done. So, <laughs> so you were basically like uh, what uh, in comic shops we call this cycle sheets, right? Where you, you count, exactly right. You're, exactly. you're essentially doing cycle sheets in on the stores. So I guess this was, I mean, so this was pre POS then for the bookstores, the, the, right? This is this is pre POS, very early days. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very early fascinating. Days. And then and then the catalog system was microfiche and all that fun stuff. But you learned a lot, right? Because working at retail, um, I never worked in a comic shop, but working a bookstore, the similarity is just working at retail. Mm-hmm. You're physically talking to customers every day, and you physically touch every book every single day, right? You're selling them, yeah. putting them up, unpacking boxes. So you really learn actually a lot about the business. <laughs> yeah, sure. So. How, so how do you – do you still draw from that, that period? Like the, what, are the, what are the big lessons that, that kind of came out of that for you? I mean you've had a long and varied career in nearly every aspect of, of comics and book sales. Like you and starting from that space, it, it feels like this was just like this was the first step in a long path uh, yeah. that led from one to the next. So is there I mean, aside from that, like is there any big moments during that period where you are um, that you look back on? Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the things I learned from working retail, and in this case specifically a bookstore, but you can draw similarity to when I was working for my dad's video rental store, is that if you pull back the curtain, and you and I have both worked in publishing, when you sit in those publishing meetings, you have all these ideas. Now, everybody's going to know this book. Everyone yeah. knows that this book is for lovers of romanticy or this or Alan Moore, or they're going to respond to this marketing campaign. At retail, nobody knows anything. Like, none yeah. of that information or campaign filter down to, to, you know, filter down to the retail level. You know, most of the customer either don't know what they want, or they think they know what they want, but the information is actually wrong. So I'll give you one example, right? So when I was working for Random House, we published a line of very successful books that's based that's based on alternate history you know what if south won the civil war what if germany won world war ii etc etc and then in our marketing meeting everybody's so excited like it's going to be great people going to come to the bookstore ask for which alternate history book to recommend the store clerk could recommend our books i'm like yeah i don't think that's going to happen so i will take my entire staff to our local bookstore and just start tracking down employees to be like to be like Hey, what alternate history book you can, that that you can recommend? And nobody knows what we're talking about. Another example, you actually just reminded me. I totally forgot about this story. When the movie Sin City came out, right? Sure. I did a test. I went to seven different retailers, um, specifically bookstores. I went to seven different bookstores, and each bookstore, I asked them a question. Hey. Where can I find the book Sin City by Frank Miller? You know, the, the, the movie was huge, right? In seven stores, not a single clerk knew what I was talking about. They were like, what? Huh? <laughs> you know? So it was wow. like, there was just a lot of stuff that doesn't filter through. So that's yeah. what I think is learning. Like, you have to go so much deeper How do you, to help you know, people find the books. So this was around 2005 or so, right? So you would be at Diamond Book Distributors. We'll, we'll get to that in the timeline. But I'm, yeah. uh, this actually, it, it actually it hits something that I've always, and I, we don't mind the digression. When it, when you and I met, you were at DVD and you were, right. um, and I was working for Valiant as a comic book publisher. And one of the things that we really were struggling with was in the comic shops, We had we knew who they were, right? We knew who... The salespeople were. We knew who the hand sellers were. Like we had mm. made a study of those comic shops and who you know, and the staff of those stores. Um, and one of the really big uh, challenges that we had in trying to move into bookstores was how hard it was to get to know mm. them on that granular level, right? Right. Is that like it, it? Have you seen anybody really crack through on that? Is that something? Is just it's always going to be an issue? I mean, I you know. Everyone wants to do POP and, um, you know, do different programs to try and get that attention. But is there any, have you seen in your years, have you seen anybody kind of crack through that? Like, how do you build that interpersonal connection with the, with the staff, with the hand sellers in those stores? 
Yeah, I do see people crack through. I think, again, that similar to the comics retailers, right, to get to know those hand sellers, it doesn't just magically happen, right? It takes right. a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to meet hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of people sure. and maintain that, that relationship. I would say it's the same with the bookstore with a caveat. The caveat is that with the onset of the large chain bookstores, such as Barnes & Noble and back in the day Borders, Mm -hmm. and so on these stores are so much larger they have so many more employees and because they're not your small local independent staffed by two or three passionate people these larger superstores they more cycle people through yeah so the turnover is very high right this person that just joined this bookstore yesterday worked at a Starbucks and in two weeks left the bookstore to join the Bed Bath and Beyond Right. I, I know I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of making light of it, but sure. that was the biggest challenge for, for the chain bookstore, was really the turnovers, and the fact that it, those models did not always really attract people who are lifers, in book selling, if that makes sense. Whereas yeah. your local independent bookstore, yeah. I think it's far closer to your local comics retailer. Oh, but, that is interesting, right? Yeah. So that the, so the chains are not where the lifers end up. The, the, the smaller mom and pop stores or where they end up is where you end up focusing, which is why it's so difficult, right? It ends up being ground game as opposed to like, you know, uh, doing it from 10,000 square, 10,000 feet, some, right? You have some. And when you track down a great, um, a great hand seller is, is gold. Oh, like yeah. I remember when I was, I'm, I know I'm jumping around. Oh yeah, when please. I was Random House, one of my job was publishing fantasy novels. And oh yeah. My author, what D and D author, but, R.A. Salvatore, Tracy Hickman, and Mara oh. the Wise. And I tracked down a husband and wife manager team at Walden Books in Milwaukee, which at the yeah. time was the home to Gen Con. So yeah. not yeah. they were big gamers. And these people, this couple, Jay and Deb Nelson were their name, they can hand sell a thousand copies in their one Walden store of a new novel by Weston Hickman or Bob Salvatore. So when what? you track down people like that, you just like, oh, yeah. you know. They get, they get Christmas very, very gifts well. every year from now <laughs> exactly, on. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Wow. Yeah, a thousand copies they could they could hand sell. Out of a Walden Books. Like those were not those were not big locations, as I remember. They were little strip mall places. That's, a, that's incredible. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, that if we're getting back to your timeline then. Uh, so... <laughs> You end up, uh, you end up going. You become assistant sales rep. You're, you're, you're counting books, and uh, and apparently you counted so well, right? <laughs> that they said uh, it's time for you to move to the big city and move in, work in real big boy publishing. Yeah, did you? So when you you moved to New York, I, my, my notes say ninety three. Is that right? So. It's step by step, right? So sure. like, like like so many things, you know, very few things alive are a rocket ship. You kind of slowly move your way up from yeah. counting books, and then you get to sell a bookstore in Oakland, and then they actually moved me to Seattle first. Oh, okay. Um, because a the their local Seattle rep had just retired, and they asked me if I, if I'm willing to move to Seattle, and I'm like, no, I never been to Seattle. Um, <laughs> I want you to fly me there first. So I could see it. And I remember my boss at the time was completely shocked. You know, I'm like 20 years old. I'm like demanding a free plane ticket to check out Seattle first. He's like, okay. Yeah. But to make a very long story short, and then I moved to Seattle, became the sales rep, sort of the Pacific Northwest area. You know, did that for a few years, and then was asked to move to the headquarters in New York City. At the time, specifically to take over to be the person in charge of sunny science fiction and fantasy line. And then from, from, from that on, you know, my, my job changed every two years, but partially because I was willing to say yes to anything, yeah. um, which yeah. I found to be a really helpful career move. It's like, oh, you need someone to do Garfield? I'll do it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No one else wanted to handle Garfield. So I was like, I'll do Garfield. You know, that sounds like fun. You know, I know that we both have uh, I know this just be, from knowing you as many years as we've been together, uh, that you and I both really do like bringing people up and talking to like, you know, people are just getting started in, in this industry and, and, and kind of, you know, kind of helping guide where you can. I mean, as yeah. you, advice is always tough, you know, because I don't know, I didn't listen to any advice back then. <laughs> um, 
But it's it's interesting to me that like I, our stories kind of match a little bit mm. uh, in that I, I started working in a comic book shop in the early 90s and then started working as a regional uh, sales rep for Fantagraphics uh, right. just in that area and was just, you know, writing orders for Golden Apple and, you know, um, Roy Root, you know, would write a, a regular big order that yeah. maybe he didn't, never paid for. Whatever. Uh, but uh, uh, he, so, uh, and because of that, like when it when time came for me to move from retail into publishing, uh, you know, I'd already had that experience. Like I was already yeah. ready, you know? So I, I can see that saying yes and being able to try any little thing, even though it's kind of outside of your expertise, you know, exactly. has, it makes um, a big difference. I want to add a quick side note since you sure. mentioned Fanographic. Yeah. Fanographic's house. It's five yes. minutes walking from my house. What? I walk out of my front door five minutes. I'm at the Fanographics office. So and you've been so you've I'll been down that. in the basement of the the Fanographics office. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. That incredible yeah. library. I right. think I think Gary's still trying to put together like the entire. I don't know. All comics. Anyway, that's a side <laughs> story. But no, absolutely. Say yes to everything and fake it till you make it. Sure. Which I actually find a fascinating concept because, I mean, so many of the corporate job, they hire people based on resume, right? right? Yeah. Do you have Do you have experience? Yeah. But what I find so interesting when I look at everything I've done, so many of the things I've done in my life, in, in, in the business world, I've never done before. So I don't exactly know why these company gave me a chance they must sell something yeah to be like you never sell video games how about you sell video games for us you know I'm like sure and then, yeah and then, and then you learn on the job <laughs> it's aggregating experience right i mean you you worked in the video store you, so you felt confident working with people so you know you worked in a bookstore right and that allowed you to get to more comfortable with books so you worked selling books it's just aggregating right. experience as opposed to like leapfrogging with experience, right? Yeah, you know? it's aggregating, but I, but I think it's also look for people who are very curious, who love learning. Yes, because, amen. You know, I mentioned video games, so that's a true story. When I was working for Random House, Random House decided to launch a video game distribution business. This was when games was on CD-ROM. True. And my boss and the book side of, of the business he was a cfo he came to me and said hey we're launching a video game distribution business i want you to run it and i was like sure sounds great and then i'm like i don't know anything about video games so i remember <laughs> running out that afternoon to a barnes noble and bought and subscribed to every video game magazine that i could find you know yeah and then just started learning like all right i need to learn who the studios are what are the formats so Man, yeah. And that's our, been the pattern. <laughs> for our younger listeners, uh, magazines were YouTube channels, <laughs> but they were on paper, and you would have to go somewhere, or they would come to your house. It was magic. <laughs> uh, you said this boss was a CFO. Is that Ed Vellini? Did no, I get that uh, this was pre-Ed Vellini. This has okay. a connection to comic. Pre-Ed Vellini, pre it was a gentleman named Gilbert Perlman, Okay. He has he plays three very important roles in in, in comic. Actually, what well, two and a half? One is that um, when he eventually re left Random House, he took the Random House distribution business with him, and then built a company called CDS, which became the first distributor for bookstores, for Dark Horse, and also for Tokyo Pop, and so on and so forth. So he was a big, you know, he was a very in, he was an early influential person to try to get manga and graphic novels into bookstores. The second part, that the part he plays in the history of Gilbert Perlman, is that his son, a man named Michael Perlman, whom I've mm -hmm. known since he was like five years old, Michael Perlman is now the man in charge of distribution for Simon & Schuster, mm -hmm. who currently handles you know, Viz Media um, and Boom, and they recently just signed uh, Image Comics. Yeah, that's how Michael Perlman and his father was my boss. So that's and insane. we used to do not just comics, but sci-fi, fantasy, gaming. I remember I really wanted Random House to get into gaming, mm -hmm. so I actually took Gilbert, the CFO, the man in a suit. I took him to Gen Con, and I think he stayed for two minutes. He couldn't handle it, 
but he got it. He got right. it. He was like, this yeah. is not for me, but I got it. Right. This is huge. <laughs> That's enough, right? If he understood exactly. it. Yeah. He was really smart that way, yeah. That's incredible. He was Gilbert like, Perlman. So these people pay money to be in here to play games and buy games? I'd say, yeah. He said, I got it. He said, now I want to leave, but I got it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> he was great. Yeah. That's awesome. Gilbert That's amazing. Okay, well, I want to I want to go back just real quick. Sorry, I'm, so I'm I want to around. Yeah. No, I like it. I like the, the jumping around. Uh, but I do did want to not miss. So you, when you're there, you're uh, associate produ- uh, associate producer, associate publisher, right? <laughs> and during right. that period, um, uh, my notes here say you took well, they took sales from twenty million to fifty million, right? Is that is that an accurate statement? This is around ninety five in that area. Eventually to a hundred, yeah. Eventually like, to a hundred. He, 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 he's not a rocket ship. It's like sure. grew, grew, grew. But you know, yeah. there's some shenanigans. There's some, you know, there's some shenanigans in in there too. <laughs> like what? You Tell me some shenanigans. It. So there's an advantage to be steeped in pop culture and okay. you know things that so called mainstream people don't know. So for yeah. example. Um, I don't want to get into the deep history, but the deep history is J.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, yeah. was you know published in the in you know since the 1950 by Ballantine Book, which is a division within Random House that publishes fiction. That's the way it always has been. Right. So I found out sort of two years before this happened that New Line was going to make these movies. So I casually walked over to a junior financial analyst <laughs> who um, her name is Kathy Tucker and I walked over to them hey these token book they're fantasy right she goes well yeah huh shouldn't they be coded to the fantasy division which is Del Rey she's like oh yeah you're right and she literally changed the coding in the financial system so in a single keystroke all the revenue came to my P&L which nobody care because they, you know, they they sell okay, and then two <sighs> years later the Peter Jackson movie hit, and I sold 10 million copies that first year, and I still remember at the time the CEO of the company Gina Centrillo she just came to my office and she goes I know what you did I'm like I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> because at the end of the day it doesn't matter right it, it, it's all the same company. You're right, exactly. But you just hit my PNL rather than someone else's PNL. So, that so is, there's a lot of stuff like that. That is brilliant. Um, all right. So, I've already got story, a favorite so. moment in this interview. That's excellent. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So, well, I mean, overall, though, I mean, would, would you say it was just the, the – was there, was there more like that that you were doing? Or how, how, where did that growth come from? Was it an overall, you know, um, pop culture shift? Was it you riding a wave? Did you, like, you know, run the wave machine? Like, uh, give me some, I mean, I, I guess what I'm looking for here, here is I know you to be brilliant, but that's a huge jump in a few years, right? So where did that, where is that? Well, you know, f- first of all, everything is a team effort, right? I'm, yeah. I'm the one telling the story here. So I get to tell the story my way. Right. But behind exactly. every story, there's a team, right? Sure. There's a lot of, a lot of different people involved. So there's a lot of sitting goals and just specifically go out and try to make things happen, try to be Mm -hmm. a rainmaker. When I was in my early 20s, um, I read a very influential book. Um, You might remember a sports agent named uh, Lee Steinberg. Mm -hmm. Um, He was the sports agent that inspired the Tom Cruise character in, in 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 the film Jerry Maguire. Yeah. So I read his memoir. Uh, Lee Stamber, and there's a story in the memoir he talks about. So, so, part of what he does as a sports agent is he visits a lot of high school athletes in small town America, right? And okay. he's typically sitting down and talking and talking to the grandmother. That's what he tells it. In, he tells it in his book. And what he would do is, first of all, not only did he flew all over the country to visit these high school athletes, hoping to sign them to represent them. That's the first lesson: is you go to them. They don't come yeah. to you. That's the first lesson. The second lesson is before he goes through that small town, and it's usually a small town, he learns everything he could about it. 
He's like, what is town? going on? What's the politics? What's going on with the mayor, the city council? What's the high school team called? And just he just learns everything. So he puts in a lot of work. So what I took from that and what I did at Random House was, A, I went to see people. So I was like, oh, I want to sign away R.A. Salvatore. I want to sign away Wilson Scott Card. You know, I want to sign away Rob or Jordan and so on and so forth. And every author I flew to their house. I said, I want to come see you. Right. So I went to see Robert Jordan, you know, in Charleston. Mm. I went to see Tracy yeah. Hickman in New Mexico, and and so on and so forth, right? Yeah. So that's the first lesson. And the second lesson, again, from that book is I would oh. just read out the book and learn everything I can. I will learn their family's name, their dog's name. Sure. So it's just a lot of preparation, a lot of work, and then you just go and go do the thing. And then the business <laughs> just grew very, very fast because we keep acquiring content. Yeah. And also licenses, right? Because I acquired Peanuts, acquired Star Wars, acquired Halo. But he, but, this, but, he, but he saw the same lesson that I learned from that book. You go right. see them and you learn yeah. everything you can about their business, which to me is a sign of respect. Yeah. Right? That you respect yeah. them so much that you learn everything that you can by the time you are meeting with them. Basically, it's that you're prepared. You don't just show up and be like, hey, I'm Random House. Sign here. Like, he doesn't work like that. <laughs> I'm totally reading this book. If for no other reason, then it's going to reinforce what uh, has been a career path for me as well. It's uh, yeah. yeah, it really does hold fast. I mean, you know, it's it's easy to think about business as um, you know, it's just numbers, right? It's easy to think about even our business just as uh, uh, spreadsheets and title right. listings. But the truth is, it's just people, right? And people if you get business, to, if you're right. just getting to know people. Um, and you, as, as, as I've noted, like um, the people I've always talked to you about you and it's been my experience has been like this master networker. Um, and I can see that, that 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 how that skill continues on on for you. Um, so actually, before we get to the networking bit, though, I did want to before <laughs> we leave the, the 90s, I want to talk about uh, a man named Ed Vellini, who. Okay. Uh, I found to be like I just just did a little bit of scratching at the surface of of this guy, but man, what a powerhouse this guy was, right? And so, tell me about your time with Ed. Tell me what you learned. Like, uh, I want to hear a bit more of that. And I, I know that's a, a deep cut, but uh, you know, that, like I said, people are I find fascinating. So, well, Evelini, who was my boss for a time at Random House, he was CFO. Uh, he had came to Random House from previously worked at Madison, Madison Square Garden mm -hmm. and I believe he worked with I believe he worked with he's either Guy Carroy who later joined Marvel or is someone else which I can't remember right now I haven't thought about adding a very long time so, you, <laughs> so you're testing my memory but I Excellent. know that he he worked we with can cut this ex... out I just want to let you know you know it's okay to... but, okay. but, but <laughs> it, it, it's relevant because Ed worked yeah. with someone at Maxwell Garden that eventually became the president of Marvel. I just don't remember exactly who he was. Wow. Because that became important later. Uh-huh. And a project I, I was doing involved with with Marvel. So Evelini was my boss. He was really interesting because so see Random House then and now is a private company. Right. So he doesn't have to report it's is in the financials. So working for the CFO was fascinating because I, I learned the dark arts of finance. He would just move money around. So, he, so, so, so I'll give you two quick examples, very quick. So he would be like, ah, oh, we're signing this author for a million dollars, right? For uh, three books. Let's spread the cost over 20 years. So it's not, so he, so he doesn't go on one right. accrual accounting, right? And or, He's gonna say, um, or, or to give it, to give the opposite example, when Random House was acquired by Bertelsmann, you know, it was you know previously owned by Advanced Publication by Sign Newhouse. When Bertelsmann acquired Random House, there was a transition year, where kind of the financial doesn't matter, if you know what I mean. Okay. Because it's like a year that doesn't count. Right. You know, right. Because the transaction is happening. So Ed comes to me and goes, "Let's pile ten years of losses in this year." So we have to be sort of taking future losses in this year. So I'll be like, this book will never make money. Let's just count the losses now. 
I mean, I can give you a thousand more examples, but he was a master of the financial dark card. I learned so much from him. I learned oh my a million ways to hide money, show a profit, show a yeah. loss, which to this day I still use. Because now I can read a company's balance sheet and go, I know what you're doing. <laughs> you know oh, right. Oh. My boss was the master. I learned from him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was your Sith Lord, right? You were, uh, yeah. Yeah, that uh, was that's, great. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Well, I haven't excellent. talked to him in years. Wow. Yeah. Well, you know, like, like you said, like, like Lee Steinberg said, you know, we wanted to do our research and get to know you. Um, so that led you to uh, launching, you know, the, the company where you and I met. Right. That's right. Diamond, Diamond Book Distributors. Uh, so, dime, A, I mean, I, I think I, it's such an interesting thing for looking at the history of Diamond. The way they typically have grown is by buying other companies, right? Um, I mean, right. I'm, I'm generalizing, but like, but no, it's Diamond, true. Yeah. Diamond Book Distributors really does feel like it. I mean, you know, what little research I've been able to find on it feels like them really saying, it, it let's make something of our own um right. I, and i and this is no slap against any of them i think they've done a brilliant job of of both sides of that uh but tell me about that experience like how do they how do they approach you how do they find you like how does that how does that even begin well try to make a long story short so first of all remember the name i mentioned earlier gilbert perlman i yeah. said he was very in, influential in the history of comic um, so he started the separate company called CDS, which is fine. And then, so as he was doing that, Diamond's like, oh shit, we have competition of you know, distributing graphic novels, comic, game, manga into books, so we better start our own. So they tried to hire this guy named Michael Murphy, who was one of my colleagues at Random House. So they tried to hire Michael to come to Diamond to start DVD. Michael yeah. turned them down because Michael had actually accepted the job to work for Gilbert to help him start CDS. However, because Michael's a friend of mine, when Michael turned Diamond down, he said, well, thank you, but no thanks. I'm turning you down, but you should call my friend Kuyu. <laughs> so Roger Fletcher, someone nice. that you know very well, who yeah. was uh, head of sales at Diamond, head of sales at Mark, so Roger Fletcher cold calls me. I have no idea who he is. I knew Bill Shanis very well, because when I was at Random sure. House, I regularly went down to Diamond and also to Cap City to try to sell them exclusive covers for my Star Wars book. But that's a story for, a story for another day. I got you. Um, so I knew Bill very well, but no idea you know, who Roger Fletcher is. So, so he calls me up in a very Roger Fletcher way. He's yeah. like, so um, we want to get like um, graphic novels into bookstores. And uh, he's just like going around in circles. I was completely confused. I was like, wait, are you, I'm Random House. Are you trying to get my books into bookstores? I don't understand. Yeah. So, and then, so this went on for a very long time. I said, wait a minute. Are you trying to hire me? Well, yeah. Oh, why didn't you say so? <laughs> that tracks. So, yeah. So what happened is, so I did the same thing when I was at Random House when they wanted me to move from San Francisco to Seattle. I'm like, well, I don't know if I want to work for you. Can I come in and interview you? So they <laughs> say sure. So I took yeah. the train down to Timonium. Yeah. And I interviewed the 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 UMT people in comics might know as the upper management team. Yes. I Diamond. Yeah. And I interviewed them. I, I, and then what I did was so meaning at I was time, asking them at this time I was that asking is tons of questions, right? So that's that's Bill, that's Roger. Uh, that's... Bill, Roger, Chuck Parker, yeah. Larry, who's the CFO, and Cindy Fournier, who's Cindy. head of the warehouse. Yeah, I remember Cindy. Yeah, yeah. and off with Jeppy. You know, Jeppy was there. Yeah. So to make a very, very long, long story short, but with, there, there's actually a cool story from that. So in addition to the interview, you know, I'm there. I might as well hang out. So yeah. they actually let me sit in on a UMT meeting. So I'm just a fly on the wall, right? They're having a UMT meeting going through their topics. And one of the topics was the publisher CrossGen, who was in financial trouble at the time. You know, Chris uh -oh. Alessi yeah. and uh, Chris Orr. And there's Bill Shane. So 
for those who might remember, CrossGen was a successful upstart who badmouthed Diamond every single day. Diamond sucks, yes. Diamond sucks, Diamond sucks. So CrossGen team financial trouble. I'm a fly on the wall, sitting in the back, in the UMT meeting, and there's Bill Shanus, passionately defending CrossGen. It's like, we have to save them. Because, he said, a publisher of this size going out of business is bad for comic shops. I mean, that was a key moment for me. That was yeah. a serious key moment. I'll never forget that moment. I was like, hmm. Because I've heard so many negative stories about Diamond as the bad empire, as the evil empire. Sure. I don't know if I want to work here. But sitting through that meeting, I was like, you know what? Not everything I heard is true. These people yeah. actually care a lot about comic shops and publishers. So I That has been my experience. Them. That has yeah. been my experience as well. Um, you know, I think ever since that they've had that, well, during the period where they had that, you know, quote unquote monopoly, um, right. you know, they, I think both hired people who loved comics and comic shops. Right. And right. so they were, they was in that DNA. Um, and, and they realized that the only way they could grow was to grow the comic shops. That's right. right? And the only way to do that was, uh, uh, as a publisher. One of the things that I realized <clears throat> really early on having left, being in retail and moved to uh, publishing is that in many ways, Diamond was the bank of comics, right? They're both right. borrowing and lending, right? They right. just, they just like, they took from these people and gave to these people and then, you know, and then back and forth. And as it, you know, as they're pumping blood around the, the, the cardiovascular system of comics. So uh, it was, it was fascinating. That's really interesting that, to, to hear that. So, I mean, and does the rest of the room like, yeah, but but this guy down in Florida has been bad mouthing us every week. He's got a he's yeah. got a he's got an office full of people that he paid to move to Florida. <laughs> Gave them all health care. What's that about? Yeah, uh, no, I don't know. Yeah, 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 I don't know. All right. Well, cool. Well, listen, at DVD, we could talk about that period. I'm sure, you know, yeah, that I mean, that was a long stretch for you. Fun um, times. Fun yeah. times. It was the beginning of so many things. We were trying to do so many things that had never been done before. It, it, it was fun. We did some stuff well. Yeah. We did a lot of stuff very poorly. You know. <laughs> so that's how it goes. But yeah. Everything we try to do, it was never been done before. For example, very very quickly. Yeah, please. So so in the U.S., in the U.K., in some other country, um, for the bookstore business, you have certain codings for metadata. I know this sounds really yeah. boring, but it's actually very fun. So in the I US, find it fascinating. In the U.S., yeah. it's called BISAC code, and in the U.K., it's called Big Code. And in the U.S., there was no BISAC code for graphic novels. So you actually took – I'm, I'm going to forget all the details. It was Neil Gaiman. It was Colleen and one other creator. They went to basically lobby the U.S. Or, organization to create a graphic novel code, right? So, so that's what they did. So I went to the equivalent organization in the U.K., to be like, hey, we should create a bicep code for graphic novels, manga, yeah. comics. And this guy, who, by the way, he's a sir, he's knighted, and he wears a bow tie. Mm. He actually said to me, we have not created a new code in 100 years. I was like, hmm, good for you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> I was like, you know what, forget it. <laughs> uh, yeah. We would, we would figure out figure out another but that's what i'm talking about. everything we did he was for the first time everybody was like, what sure. are you doing <laughs> what are you selling what is I manga, find... <laughs> manga. <laughs> i personally find the metadata problem to be fascinating i think it's really but again you actually highlight something and this is a total digression on a digression yeah but one of the real challenges in <laughs> metadata is that you need to describe what the, the market needs right now and in doing right. so you have to encode uh, a certain standard of, of practice. Well, I mean, comics is the Wild West, right? We don't like to be told what to do. The number right. of times I've sat in publishers' offices and said, well, which BISAC code is it? I don't know. How many can you pick? You know, that's, I mean, because we want to we figure out, like, all the ways to hack, you know, uh, right. the, the, the system. Oh, so I want to tell a super quick metadata story. Um, oh, I, so when I, I was, love when it. I, when I was working at Diamond, I was approached by Google, <laughs> Uh -huh. So Google's search people came to me and they go, because I have a friend there, and, and they're like, so we really want to encode the metadata and index comics so people can find them, people know what's coming up, blah, 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 blah. 
I'm like, uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. You know, in book, there's ISBNs and you know, in other businesses, there's UPC Co. He said, in books, in comics, the only thing we could find is something called a diamond code. What is that? <laughs> I'm not going to tell the rest of the story, but that's sure. we have so many meetings. And I eventually brought in Chris Powell and tried to get that whole thing going. But the Google yeah. search people were stymied. They were like, what's a diamond code? <laughs> it was so well, great. Well, this is a digression on top of yours. But do you know about the Comet? Comet? Have you heard about Comet? It's being announced this week uh, as at um, at the Comics Pro meeting. The Comics Pro? No, I, I don't know it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not going to. I don't. I'm not going to pretend I know more than I do, and I'm not going to be there this weekend. It's the first the first Comics Pro meeting that they've ever had that I'm not going to be at. Yeah. Uh, but uh, they, uh, yeah, the Comet is the the new standard uh, metadata standard that they're going to be <laughs> pitching as, as an organization. So amazing. I know it finally came around. You were that. You were you later. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. That's great. That's so, really cool. We could. You and I could talk about that, that you know, that stretch in your uh, resume all night long. Uh, but, and we have, right? Uh, yeah. But let's, I want to talk really about what I, what I have found, I mentioned this earlier, I found to be your superpower, right? Um, and that is your, your ability to, to network and get to know people. We talked about Lee Steinberg and how um, influential he was on you. But a couple of, uh, as I was doing the research, I talked to a couple of our friends, and uh, and again, I, I mentioned these in in the intro uh, about you being a connector of people, right? And how, uh, uh, according to our friend Dirk Wood, you're the social director of the international comics world. Dirk. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, he said he I think actually uh, attributes the success of their uh, incredible rock band, The Tiger and the Scorpion to you bringing people to their shows at Frankfurt Book Fair says that you would have big dinners of uh, of all these comics and books uh, people and bring he, them to the show. Yeah. Our good friend Dirk exaggerates. Um, <laughs> I mean, obviously, all the success credits to Lance Critter and Matt Parkinson yes. and Dirk and other Team Weesh. Uh, what I did was I tried to bridge no, no, sorry, that's the wrong word. I try to expand the audience, right? Because when Dirk and Land used to do their concerts, do the rock shows at Frankfurt Book Fair, which is the biggest gathering of publishing professionals in the entire world. It's several hundred thousand people every October in Frankfurt, Germany. So they would do the rock show, which is incredible. And they would invite their friends in comics, which is incredible. But then I would bring in people from Random House, from Amazon, from Google, from Microsoft, from Rakuten, and and then from you know Kodansha, and then you, so so that's what, so that's my tiny little part, and then the, every year the, the 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 fan base will kind of grow beyond just the comics fans, so I think that's what he is referring to. Sure. But at the end of the day, it's a great rock show. You know, no one's I... gonna say no to that. So. I don't think you should diminish your part in this coup. I think you are you are the secret sauce behind the uh, was it the spider and the scorpion? I've still the tiger and the scorpion. I've never tiger actually seen a play. Spider. spider and the scorpion. What am tiger I thinking? And scorpion. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, madhouse flowers. Yeah. <laughs> um, our our friend Josh Hayes says that he and you had a contest to any time there was somebody na whose name mentioned to say who who knew them. Right, that he always felt like you know you you're always trying to one up each other as to who who you knew, uh, and that how how difficult it was to out network the coup. It's just impossible that uh, you're you're always, you know, digging deep. Well, but it, you know, right? But it takes work, right? You know, I referenced sure. earlier about you know the influence on me from the sports agent Lee Steinberg, is that when I c come across a new person. I learn about them. I go to their website, go to the LinkedIn, their social, if they've written a book, if they have publication, if they have a YouTube video, if they produce a podcast. I do it all. I do yeah. the research. I do the preparation so I know more about them. And then I keep them in a file. I have spreadsheets of people who know things I don't know because I know some things, right? Sure. sure. I don't know everything. Um, I'm good at something, other people are better at it. And I'm, so for example, 
um, I think in recent years, I was involved in a project where I needed certain expertise that I didn't have. And I called this guy, Adam Freeman, and I subcontracted my gig. Yeah. And you gave me some information. But this is what I do. I do this all the time. Yeah. It's like, I call the experts, and they help me out. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm actually all for it. As, as yeah. someone you've just identified as an expert, I'm going to take it, man. That's, uh, you know. Uh, well, that's, that's really interesting. So how, so is that expertise in experts, right? Is is that, that's how you transition. You're at Diamond, you transition from, uh, I don't know what your title was at DVD. Uh, I just remember, you know, you ran the room, you know, we would go in and we would pitch and, uh, we would give our little spread, uh, you know, our slideshow. And then we would talk about (laughs) all the promotions that we were going to do. And you'd go, yeah, yeah, yeah. People don't know you. And then we go, I know, but they should know me. This is great. <laughs> Don't they care about Archer and Armstrong? Um, and so we would do this. Uh, and then we would all go get trashed at that, at that uh, I don't remember that name of that bar. Oh, the Scott outdoors. Hatfield's bar. I don't, Scott I don't Hatfield's High bar. Tops. High Tops. Oh, High God. Tops. Yeah. God. Scott Hatfield and Jeremy Atkins. That's yes. Uh, that was um, that was a terrible place. It was Let's a horrible we'll place. Again. Please never. Please never. Let's never go there. Um, Okay, so anyway, you end up at Diamond. You're going to – you move into VP of International Sales. How does that differ no, from – No, sorry, no, sorry. No, no. I was never VP of International Sales. Oh, no. I was, ju- I was just ahead of Diamond. I would, sorry, not ahead of Diamond. Oh. I was just ahead of DVD. I oh. hired Scott Hatfield to be my head of International. Oh, okay. Yeah. I got you. So he, All right. So he ran International, but he reported to me. Okay. So, All right. Yeah. And Scott's what a character. I love Scott. Scott he, he's around. awesome. Yeah. I know. He's out there banging around. <laughs> well, that's excellent. So so talk to me about uh, so you're there. So that's 2002 to 2018? Uh 2003 to 2018. Okay. All yeah. right. Excellent. So what how do you make that transition? So you're moving out of Diamond into Repop, right? So yeah, so the story goes that so there's a there's so there's a practice that used to do a diamond, which is on the on your job on your job anniversary, the HR director sends an email to the whole company. Hey, congratulations, Adam Freeman for eleven years, or Kuyu Lane for twelve years, or Roger Fletcher for four hundred years <laughs> at Diamond. <laughs> and I got, and this is a total true story. I got uh-huh. an e- I, 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 I saw I got an email that said Congratulations to Kuyu Lang for 15 years at Diamond. That actually freaked me out. I was like, <laughs> I've been here 15 years? That is way too long in one place. Like, I don't think about it because when you just at work, right, you just work, work, work. You don't really sure. think about it. Um, like the other day, I asked, somebody asked me how old I am. I'm like, I actually don't know because I don't think about it. <laughs> about it. So anyway, to make very sure, I get this email congratulating me for 15 years at Diamond. It freaked me out. I was like, I need to leave. I can't be here. This is, I love my job. They treat me very well, about 15 years too long. So I started thinking about where do I want to go? Where do I want to go? Blah, 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 blah. And then I finally decided I'm gonna, I, I haven't told anyone yet. I'm going to leave Diamond and go work for Amazon because I live in Seattle. My wife works at Amazon. All my friends work at Amazon. It just seemed like a sure. lazy move, to be honest, right? So I haven't done anything about it. I'm just thinking about it. San Diego come San, San Diego know, comic. Just thinking about it is all Amazon needs to know. Yeah, yeah, right. You start <laughs> thinking about it, and it's gonna they're gonna start saying, "Oh, it looks like you're considering a move." Yeah. So San Diego Comic Con rolls around, and I have a standing tradition. Every San Diego is I have a beer with Mike Armstrong. Uh, oh for yeah. Those who don't know, Mike Armstrong at the time was the head of Comic Con for Repop. So we we do this every year. We meet at the Hilton and we have a beer. I had an iced tea with uh, Mike Armstrong every year at Comic Con. Yeah. You know, so you know exactly what I'm talking about. So yeah. I confided in him. I said, "Hey, I haven't told anyone yet, but I'm leaving Diamond. I'm going to go join Amazon." And there's a whole backstory of my involvement with Repop that actually goes back ten years, which I'll tell you later. Okay. And you know, Mike Armstrong is like, you know, poker face. Oh, cool, good for you. Cool, 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 cool. You know, and then we move on with our life. <laughs> <laughs> that night, I get a text from his boss, Lance Fensterman, the president yeah. of Repop. Lance is like, we need to talk. I'm like, okay. 
And then, so we, so, you know, so he calls me. He's like, so, uh, Mike Rom should tell me you're leaving Diamond. I'm like, yeah, 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 gonna join Amazon. He said, so, um, just last week, I did a, I presented a whole new strategy to the board at our company. I'm gonna completely restructure and create this new position, which is a global, the global director of business development. Are you interested? I was like, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> I was kind of pretty set to go work for Amazon and make a lot of money. You know, <laughs> I don't know if I want to work in the convention business, <clears throat> but that's how he started. And then same thing. Him, but you know, I've known Lance for a very long time, so sure. The, the, the more I thought about it, I think, you know what? It'd be really, really fun to work with Lance and Mike Armstrong and MK and Christina and that entire team. Yeah, and that's eventually what sold me. Um, I love but that crew. Was, you know, yeah, I love that crew. And then such so a I got recruited, crew. you know, joined the company with this new position. And the position was very, very simple. My job was to generate my job was to generate new business in whatever form possible. New revenue, okay. new product, new customer, new partners, new convention, whether that's a launch or, or acquisition, you know, new new partner to sell tickets, whatever it takes anywhere in, in the world. That was my mm -hmm. job. Just what go out an and amazing say, gig. Your P and L is a zero, right? Because your P and L has no revenue. Go and make money for us somehow. And I did that for three years until the pandemic, and the pandemic killed it. But you know, but yeah, but that's a yeah. story for another day. But <laughs> <laughs> but it did lead you into into what you're doing now, which you seem perfectly suited for, uh, which is, I mean, you know, coup worldwide. Give us the give us the, the top line pitch. What is coup worldwide? Well, first of all, before the top line pitch, you what you just said about I'm perfectly suited for it, and you're correct. I am perfectly suited for what I'm doing, but that's because what I'm doing now is a accumulation of everything I have done before, right? So you know the old saying, your overnight success, twenty years in the making, and that's what this is. In all the time I spent at Repop doing conventions, at Diamond selling comics, at Random House publishing books, and some stuff in between, each of those jobs I learned from the job, from the people I work with, and it just all came together. So it's like, okay, I have learned a lot um, in every part of the business, from publishing, to printing, to editorial, to sales, to marketing, to distribution, to website, to social, to PR. I've done it all, and I have a really strong Rolodex. Now it's time to do my own thing and mm -hmm. not work for another corporation. So it's really a accumulation of that. There's another interesting learning that I find fascinating. It's a question I ask myself a lot, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this, sure. which is that I really admire people who take the leap of faith because starting my own company i took no leap i was shoved right i was pushed off a cliff sure. meaning i was working for repop had a very good job very happy the pandemic hits we went from 52 conventions to zero and i was laid off so i was pushed because i was pushed it led me to think about what i want to do it with my life and start the company but if the pandemic never happened, I might still be there. I might be still doing the same job I did four years ago. We don't know that, but... I just want to... But well, let's talk about that because I want to challenge that a little bit. Do you... You had just you just said that, like, in you, you, you got the, the email saying, you know, congratulations, Ku, on, on being here for 15 years. And you're like, oh, <laughs> I got to get the fuck out of here. Right. Uh, you know? Um and then you started your your you were going to go to amazon right that was that was the goal right. uh and then repop said stopped it stepped in and said no 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 come and play come come to the clubhouse and play you know what you don't want to go big boy you know big boy camp yet <laughs> come and play with us um and and so you did that for a few years not long right we're talking like three years that you were there Right. You, they they laid you off because of a pandemic and they do live That's events right. and there are no pandemic. I mean, there are no live events. So, you know, they got to cut somewhere and the mm -hmm. guy with no P&L, right? He's the easy, easy cut. But 
you sure. didn't at that time say it's time to go back to the to the the plan right it's time to go back to amazon they're just down the road i know everybody there i could get a job there you didn't you said i've got this long list i've got this long list of abilities and i've got a long list of people who have abilities that i don't have and i'm going to use this right, right. i'm going to use this to build something that has my name on it right that's i mean that, i think that's that says something is that there, you know those 3 years you went from I need to move from one corporation to another corporation to I'm going to start my own. Like, yeah, but I had help. Okay, let's hear that. What was that help? I had, I won't go into detail. I want to go into detail about one specific person, but she's not sure. the only one. There were at least two other friends of mine that have been whispering in my ear during those three years, like stop, literally say stop working for the man and start your own thing. So yeah. put that aside. Um, I have a coach. I have an a I have an executive coach. Her name is Diana Scott Shield. Her company name is Fresh Mind Coaching. I've actually known her forever. She's like my friend from my younger days in New York City. We went out to bars, you know, we went out to bars and clubs together. And then as we grew up, she became an executive coach, coaching like Fortune 500 CEOs. And then at some point I was like, I want you to coach me. So fast forward, when the pandemic hit, um, I still remember, I think, I can't remember if I saw you there, but we were all at C2E2 at the end of February. Yeah, I was and there. And I, yeah. I think Seattle shut down on March 2nd or something like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. I still remember coming back from C2E2, turning to my wife like, and be like, I'm gonna be fired in three months this pandemic is going to shut everything down. That's right. So I immediately went to talk to my coach and be like, I need to figure out what to do next. By the way, it, turned, it took Reed nine months to fire me. I still remember when Mike Armstrong called to fire me. I was like, what took you so long? He's like, <laughs> yeah, we're kind of idiots. We couldn't get our act together. I was like, what took you nine months to fire me? We ran no conventions for nine months. What were you doing? <laughs> but I had nine months to plan it to write a strategy to start sure. my own company. Anyway, sorry, I went off tangent. But my coach is incredibly helpful today. Yeah. But specifically doing that transition could not have done it with without her help. Now, it would have been impossible. You did mention to me, uh, I think back when you you were did the us the incredible service of, of paying me to do what I probably would have done anyway, which is to chat with you once a week. Um, but um, you mentioned that you had an executive coach. Uh, right. And so what you're saying to me now is that you, you started with this, uh, with her, what was her name again? I got Fresh Mind Coaching. It's like Diana, Diana. Shield, like right. S-H-I-E-L-D. We're, we're going to make sure that, that uh, links to her go into the show notes. I appreciate that. Um, so, so Diana, when did you start? You, so you started working with her at, while you were at Repo? Yeah, I don't remember the date over the year. Um, okay. I don't remember specifically, but the but the the important thing was just just how helpful she was. But there was a timing issue because when I was working for Repop and doing all these convention stuff all over the world, cause we were in eleven countries. Mm -hmm. I was almost never home. Yeah, which actually meant getting coaching was really hard because I, I didn't have a set schedule. Right. So when the pandemic hit, it actually became very easy to have a weekly coaching session on Zoom. You know, so it, it was. Yeah not planned that way but it just worked out sure so we will meet once a week and we will go through what i'm going through and my options and she would be very hard on me you know she never told me what to do uh -huh. it was more about accountabilities and asking questions so she'll ask questions like why do you want to do that why don't you want to do that and i will have to kind of you know come up with some sort of bullshit answer and she'll right. be like yeah that's not true that's not why you want to do that. You're like, well, you know, and I would, you know, I would get in defensive. And what she always said to me is, she's like, who, cool, you know the answers. You just don't realize that yet. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a spectacular. <laughs> yeah. What, so where, where do you think, is there a pivotal skill? I mean, being an expert on experts, is there a pivotal skill that she has as a coach that, that, uh, that has gotten you to that place? Is it just, asking you i mean 
I mean, I don't want to overshare, but uh, I've recently started seeing a therapist and I can say that the, the biggest um, lesson that I got from it was how much I did know the answer, right? Just having a session right. where you it's expected that you are going to talk through the things you're dealing with where you go, oh, yeah, OK, that's obviously that's the obvious. Thing. And then they go, fine, here's a bill. You know, it's a uh, it's a really nice gig for them in those days. But um <laughs> But my, I guess, where does the pivotal skill, would you say, for an executive coach? And, you know, yeah. Well, from my experience with Diana, I would say is accountability and specificity, which are mm -hmm. somewhat, you know, parallel. So here's what I mean, right? So, for example, let's make some stuff up. Let's be like, oh, I, I'm going to get fired by Repop. I want, I want to work for Amazon. <laughs> why? Well, because Amazon is local. Well, why is that a good thing? Well, because my wife works there. Well, why is, you know, how, how does your wife work to make that a good career move for you? So, in, 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 so, in, so basically, she tried to get very specific. Yeah. And she would kind of push past my hand-waving. Because a lot of my answers are just kind of hand-waving answers, right? Yeah. I didn't actually think it through. It you didn't want to look too hard at this problem. lazy somewhat. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to look too hard at the problem, so she would just get really specific. In fact, um, specificity is like her favorite word. I have it written yeah. on my whiteboard <laughs> to remind myself. Yeah. It's like, yeah, let's not be too vague. So she's really good at that. She just like gets deeper and deeper. Why do you want to do that? Why do mm -hmm. you not want to do that? <laughs> so again, she never told me what to do. She just keeps, she tried to get me to defend myself. Sure. Essentially, you know, I have to define my position. So it's like, hmm, okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Do you ever get a feeling that she's like, um, that she's guiding you somewhere, or is she really just making you drill all the way down? Like, is there? I feel like if both, she's guiding me towards what I really want and what I really believe. Yeah. So that's wonderful. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. What a gift, man. Yeah, it's, it's great. Congratulations. That's what that's wonderful. Well, excellent. So so she guides you into launching this company and that's right. Uh, which, by the way, you know, I, I so when I picked the name of my company, I, I picked Prana um, Direct Market Solutions because, A, I love the direct market and that of the direct market comic book shops are, you know, they're, they're a specialty of mine. Yeah. And um, and I just love the, everything about the culture and, you know, the systems that make it work. And the people, right? I just love the people yeah, involved, yeah. right? Um, and prana because I, you know, kind of grew. Uh, I I love yoga, right? And uh, exactly. and the that's it. Uh, that's you know that's the ancient you know yoga Sanskrit, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and it's yes, uh, it's I'm about aware. life and it's about that. But when my favorite my my favorite story, and I haven't actually told this, I don't think to anybody in public, is when I'm trying to decide it. Uh, what to call it, uh, you know, I had lots of advice on, you know, it should be like short box or, you know, anything really comics related. <laughs> and uh, mo one, one of the people said, look, just pick a name that you know you're going to be, you're going to want to work hard for. And right. finally, it was Alex Cox, who now ah. works at Image. He goes, yes. just call it Prana. You know, that's what you want to do. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it. yeah. So I love but it. Talk about specificity, coup worldwide, right? You, I mean, you. If anybody knows the international scene for business, for comics, for pop culture, for geek-related culture, it's it's you, right? And you, I mean, that's a it's a very big mandate, coup worldwide. Like you well, didn't. It's a selling point, and it's a wish fulfillment, right? The selling point is I'm selling myself. Mm -hmm. That's literally the company is just me. There, you know, there is no one else. So you have to trust me that I can help you with your business. The worldwide part is wish fulfillment. I really, really like traveling. And I specifically, this is again, going back to my coach, Diana, because she was trying to drill down. What is it that makes you happy? What do you want to do, you know? Yeah. And one of the things I'll be like, well, I like to travel. She'd be like, okay, then maybe you should build a company that focuses on international clients so you can go see them. So they will pay you to go see them. So that's where, so that's where the worldwide part came from. 
um, which sounds a little bit like a shipping company, but that you know, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Import export. That's uh, right. Coo- right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, well, that is, I mean, it does seem to fit you. Now, you've worked yourself into a specialty. Now, here's where we get into, uh, here's where we get into the exact reason why we approached you to, for okay. our first uh, intensive interview. We've done a few, um, and we're going to continue to do like shorter interviews with, with uh, people who run businesses that I just want to like, you know, kind of show off uh, and like show to the world. But you specifically have worked yourself into a specialty that I think is going to be incredibly valuable for our industry on every level in the hmm. next couple of years. Uh, and that is mergers and acquisitions. Yes. Right? Um, and the reason I, I feel this way about comic shops is uh, that it's it's a rough time we've had the rough we've had these rough times before in comic shops right. where you know it, 2008 was kind of set me into publishing it was so rough uh yes. we've had uh you know 2018 right around yep. um you know uh, i going back to the early 90s early mid 90s those were rough so mm-hmm. I, it's we've gone through these these posi- these transition periods before where the shops like they um they consolidate, right? As, as the right. same as all businesses, right? People decide, I'm just not ready to do this again. I'm out. So uh, they sell their, their stores and then suddenly small chains become regional chains. Right. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that. And so part of the reason we wanted to have mm-hmm. you on was as an expert in mergers and acquisitions, M&A mm-hmm. for short, uh, I know that you uh, you shared with me part of why you think uh, this is such a valuable time in publishing. Um, maybe you can talk to our audience about like that. But why you yeah, think... Sh- yeah. yeah, sure. So, um, so a super brief contact. So I've been doing mergers acquisition for 25, 30 years. Uh, when I was at Random House, one of my jobs, because I work for the CFO, right? One right. of my job was to buy companies. In fact, oh. story for another day, I tried to buy Dark Horse. Uh, I tried to buy Wizards of the Coast. I still remember talking to Mike Richardson. He's like, I would never sell. I'm like, all right. You know? um, so anyway, uh, then yeah. I was involved in merchant acquisitions at Diamond, merchant acquisitions at uh, The joke Pop. there, by the way, was a Dark Horse recently <laughs> sold twice. Like it sold yeah, to one yeah, person yeah, and yeah, sold it again. Right, right. Yeah. yeah so, so. But, the, but the thing is, when I worked at Random House, Diamond, and Repop, I was on the buy side. I was a buyer. Now, in, in my role as Cool Worldwide, I usually but not always represent the seller so just okay for that little bit of you know historical context and it's a really interesting time in publishing specifically but in the broader sense as well for mergers acquisition activity for a couple reasons i'll start on the seller side and then quickly touch on the buyer side on the seller side you were just talking about the tough time for comics retail it's also very tough for people who own bookstores, very tough for people who own toy store, people who own publishing. It's just tough for so many reasons that we don't have to get into. Whether that's labor, whether that's interest rate, inflation, rising cost, uh, whether just people are just exhausted from the pandemic and everything. Even though a lot of the publisher, not all, a lot of the publisher did quite well financially during the pandemic, it was really hard, right? G- yeah. People don't remember now how hard how hard he was. Um, so, be that as he may, you have a lot of publishers ready. They're ready to sell for all those reasons, not any one particular reason. It's a really interesting time. E- interesting time on the buy side for a couple reasons. One is related to times are tough, which means it's time to buy because organic growth is very slow. Right. So just because times are tough, but your dark horse, your random house, your whoever, guess what? Your your boss, your owner, your board of directors, they don't actually give a shit that times are tough. They go, well, how are you going to grow your business? How are you, you know, uh, how are you going to grow 10% or double your sales? And then you start to explain times are tough and this and that, and they don't, and they don't care. Mm-hmm. They said, we want growth. So that's one reason that 
you are buying growth, right? So that's one thing. Uh, so that's one thing you can do through acquisitions. The second reason is that this this is particularly to larger companies. But large company have cash because a lot of the large company are coming out of three consecutive years of really strong sales. Um, and they have cash that is allocated for the investment. Um, and they want to spend it. You know, They want to allocate those resources. So one of the things that I do is I actually talk to buyers frequently. Uh, this could be a publisher. This could be a media company. This could be private equity or just an individual wealthy investor. They will call me up and be like, hey, I have this much money, $2 million, $100 million, $300 million. I'm interested in investing in this sector. Maybe it's comic, maybe it's toy, maybe it's children's book, maybe it's biography, maybe it's maps. And I'm looking to buy the whole thing. I'm looking for a minority stake, whatever. They will give me very specific instructions on what they're looking for. And then they want me to find it for them because there is no marketplace. It doesn't exist. No, it's true. There's no listing about what's for sale. So the company, the, 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 the buyers have to rely on the broker, such as myself. There's, of course, um, other people to help them find a really, really strong asset to buy or, or to invest in. Right. So, so that's kind of a long, kind of a long answer to your question why activity sure. is so high right now it's so many factors it's not just one single thing and i think it's interesting uh, something that uh, you you noted that they have cash right it's not as That's though right. they're financing this so the the interest rates doing what they're doing doesn't really affect their need for growth right they have this cash they need to grow it it needs to be they need for to be building that business a subset of very large company they have cash Right. Okay. And then sometimes those cash goes away. Um, we can talk about that. And some company, they still want to do acquisition, but they but they are financing it, and it is more expensive. So the, it, it, there's there's all kinds, but for select number of large company private equity, they have cash on hand and they're ready to buy. Yeah. So yeah. That's that's really that's wonderful. Yeah. Well, let's talk. Uh, let's talk about the mechanics about uh, about these kinds of deals and. This is real business 101, right? Because oh, yeah. I think in a lot of ways we're going to be talking uh, to, to people that are, you know, trying to grow careers inside of comics, just trying to – maybe they're trying to get out and they've never really spent any time thinking about this. Right. Maybe they have, you know, they piled a bunch of money up over that boom during COVID and they now are thinking, yeah, this guy down the street looks like he's suffering. So um, – <laughs> Let's talk about uh, the math behind. Uh, let's uh, just just simple valuations, right? Right. How? What is the value of a company? Well, there's valuation, and then there's also the mechanics, which I, I know you want to talk about. So sure. we'll, we we will do valuation first. So the the way I think about valuation, which is how much the thing is worth, there they are really three numbers, right? There's one, there's a numbers on a balance sheet. What well, the balance sheet says, this mm -hmm. company or business or publisher or retail store is worth. So that's just math. Yeah. So that's one number. There's a second number, which is what the seller wants. So when Adam Freeman wants to sell Prana DM, you have a number in mind. That number yeah. is typically a fantasy because that's what you want and it's not based on, but it's not based on reality. But that number is important because it's the most important number to you. And you know, I just want to say it is a, a thoroughly doable number. Uh, right. you <laughs> feel free to contact me at any time. <laughs> that, that, that's what this interview is all about. It's really to us. So the first number uh, is not the first number. There's one number, which is what the balance sheet says. Sure. Another set of number is what the seller has in her head or his head. Yeah. The third number is what the buyer is willing to pay, which also has no relation to reality. Yeah. When someone really wants it, when you really want to buy that book or toy or jacket or car or laptop, whatever co-rational number you agree to your partner at home, it goes out the window, right? When you really, really want something. So in quick recap, the number of the balance sheet, that's math, the number sure. the seller wants, 
and the number the buyer is willing to pay. And my job is to triangulate those three numbers because the number have to make sense. It cannot be complete fantasy. Yeah. Then no one's going to be happy. You have to set expectation with the seller because a lot of times they have a crazy number in head. My, my company does $2 million in revenue, but I want to sell it for $45 million. That's a true story. <laughs> so you have to do a lot of managed expectation. Sure. And then you have to deal with the buyer. Yes, you're trying to drive the price up because that's my job to drive the price up, but it still has to be reasonable. Sure. For lots of reasons. One is just, you know, one, there's a couple reasons. Well, one is you have, you have to be a professional. And if you start screwing people left and right, you're never going to eat lunch in this town again, right? Right. And by the way, you want to maintain a good relationship with buyers because some of these buyers could be repeat buyers. I was about to say, it, 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 you so, know, I imagine the repeat business for buyers is actually much greater than the repeat absolutely. business for sellers, you know? I'm, right, because you only sell a company once. Yeah, right, exactly. But this buyer over whatever, 5, 10, 15 years, could buy five different companies from you. So you cannot lie. You cannot inflate the number too much. That is no longer reasonable. So you have to triangulate those three numbers. So that's sort of my, again, longish answer to your question about valuation. So it's yeah. kind of a science and art, if you want to think about it that way. Sure, sure. Wow, that's, I mean, you know, I, I think that there's a part of me is expecting you to start giving us formulas. And, uh, and then, but what you're saying makes so much more sense, right? There are formulas. Yeah. That's the first set, the, the math. There are sure. formulas, but those formulas go out the window really, really fast. Sometimes <laughs> my job is to bring people back to the formulas. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so. Do you, uh, uh, what are the multiples, like multiples up and down? Like you hit the formula, right? You hit the formula valuation. And, and I, I, you've gone through a number of these. Like what are the, is it sometimes, is it like 10x yeah. or is it like, you know, point 10x? Like, uh, this what is, is not a SaaS company. No, there's no 10x. Um, yeah. There's, they are industry standard, they're industry standard multiple. And when I say industry standard, I'm spe referring specifically to book publishing, okay. which includes comics and manga. Yeah. Um, and there's a and and it's a range, so it's not specific, right? So you either based off revenue, you based off profit, right? You base either of revenue, which is you know generating cash, partially depending on how the accounting is done, or you base it off EBITDA, right? In yeah. Profit. So if you're basing a revenue, the range is somewhere between 0 0.5 to like 1.3. Could be lower, it could be higher. Again, every case is different. If you're working off EBITDA, um, you tr the range could be somewhere between six and eight. Earnings. Again, it could be lower, it could be higher. Earnings before. Uh, uh, earning, I, I can never remember what it does. Earning <laughs> before interest, would... amortization, yeah. tax, and et cetera, yeah, et cetera, before, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. Um, so the range there is somewhere between six and eight, but it could be lower, it could be more. There's sure. so many factors, yeah. There's yeah. so many factors, you have to factor in, you know, what kind of asset, what kind of inventory, what's the cash in hand, and are, are there any intellectual properties? You know, is it a gross market? You know, is there certain expertise? Can this company do it better? Can this company do it better than anyone else? Is the market you are in, is it a gross market? Are right. you in children's comics, which is a crazy gross market? Or yeah. are you in paper maps? Not a gross market. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, I have yeah. a list of, um, I, I actually have a list of questionnaires. Uh, when I meet a new seller, I make them answer because there's all these things I need to learn about their business, which helps me figure out how to position them. Oh, so, fascinating. That's yeah. excellent. Oh, yeah. No, the, there's a whole list. <laughs> I love checklist. So I have lots of checklist. Well, so uh, let, let's talk about, so you're usually working on the seller side. Um, it's usually, also in, yeah. interesting to me, something you said earlier um, about working with those other companies uh, buying. Um, it's my understanding that Chuck Parker at Diamond, like the reason that he's there is that he was brought in to help uh, Steve Jeppe buy other companies, right? That is that sounds about right. I think he yeah. was a CPA. Yeah. yeah. I believe that sounds about right. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, one of the, one of the, uh, yeah. the silent forces in our industry that so few people really know a lot about. That's um, a good point. 
So how should a seller who's entering the market, right? They, they've decided that maybe they're done, they're ready to retire, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, right. They've had just one too many bad years. How, how do they, should they begin like thinking about like, what are, what are the changes they should be making before they go to market? And like after, after that, that like what, a, how to find a buyer is obviously some, through someone like you is very helpful. Right. But like, what do you what do you recommend? Like at the first steps, first blush. So I would say there are three key things, right? One is timing is important. So you just say something. I know you just give me an example. You have one too many bad years. Yeah, um, that's actually a terrible time to sell, right? Because you want to sell from 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 a moment of strength. That's another reason why so many publishers have to sell right now. Because so many publishers coming off actually coming off uh, record sales mm -hmm. because of the pandemic shutdown and various reasons, so now it's a really good time to sell. You know, you don't want to sell your company when you had three consecutive of bad years. That is not a good time to sell. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Right. I understand that, but if you have a choice, so so that's one. Number two, you want to really know your business and know your company. What I mean by that is that you cannot be like, my business is great because we make fucking awesome toys. Yeah, that's not gonna work. You have to actually know your business. You have to right. know your company. Like, you can't just be like, we make great comic books, we, you know, we make great toys. And that relates to the third thing, which is you you and us, you know, the people that are work, that, that, you know, that are representing the company, we have to know every detail, financially and operationally. They can't, in the selling process, there cannot be a question where the answer is, we don't know. Mm. What's this printing bill? What's this cost? What happened to this book? Why did that book sell or not sell? Everything you can think of, you have to know the answer. You right. have to. You, you cannot be like, I don't know why that book sold or why that book didn't sell. Oh, I don't know why the printing cost went up 20%. I have no idea. You cannot. You have to know everything. So to, an to, to, answer, to answer your question, if you decide today, you made up your mind, you want to sell your company, you cannot put your company up for sale tomorrow. You will take months and months and months of preparation of going through all those details. Myself and my business partner, we will ask you a thousand questions. Because we're going to, because before another company goes through your books, your operations, your finances, we're going through it first. Right. Challenging you like, what's that trip to, deep, you know, what is that trip to uh, Hawaii? On your balance, you know, like we're gonna ask just every single question that you have to have an answer. Right. By the way, the answer is fine. He, he's totally fine. That um, I took my family to Hawaii, charged charged it to the company. That's actually totally okay. You just have to know about it. Right. Okay. That's fine. You, yeah. It's your company, it's your money. You can do you can do anything you want. But you know what I mean? Like we have to be able to explain every item, and we have to understand exactly how your company operates, who does what. Wait, who designed the covers? Who did this? How much do you pay freelancer? I want to. We want to read every freelancer contract. Right. You know, right. We want to see every printing bill. So. So you do all of that due diligence before you even begin looking Correct. for a seller or buyer, rather. Right. Before we even agree to represent a seller, sometimes. Really. There are lots of seller. We. I, I'm using the we because I never do things by myself. Sure. Uh, I always bring in partner, because kind of like you know robbing a bank. Yeah. You need to build a team. Different people have different expertise. Some people are good, you know, good at opening locks. Some are, sure. good, at some are good at you know blowing stuff up. So depending on the deal, but there's one person I almost always work with. His name is David Lamb, because he's a trainee. He sorry, he's an investment banker. So I rely on his expertise to build those models, to mm -hmm. you know, build the financial model. Anyway, to make a long story short. Um, we turn down sellers actually quite frequently because we don't think the business is good enough or we don't think they're buyer or we think their valuation is completely crazy or we think they're lying <laughs> or we think they are <laughs> way too many skeletons. <laughs> There's lots of reasons why we turn someone down. Um, yeah. Or, you know, so, so anyway, to answer your question, yeah, so we do a lot of work um, even before a company goes to market. So right. by the time we go to market, we have to be able to defend it. Yeah. That's the key. 
Right. They, they've, they've answered all your questions, so you can answer all of their questions. Exactly. And right. then, even though there's always a question we never thought of. It happens every <laughs> single time. It's like, what? Oh, we didn't think of that. <laughs> uh, listen. All the time. Listen, that's... I mean, and, that's... And, and, you know, and by the way, you know, again, you, you know that you work with people like that. You know, you sometimes you're working with wonderful founder who are genius of what they do but they mm-hmm. suck at finance or you know sure. uh, didn't i say have you paid taxes for the last 10 years oh i don't know another <laughs> true story it's like you can't blame them but they're just not thinking about it they're thinking right. about doing their job but they're not yeah. thinking about you know, lots of small details yeah, well, and and I think that 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 says a lot. I mean, I, I, you mentioned that getting surprised, and it really reminded me of publishing. You right. know, you can go over a book and over a book and over a book, and you have right. You've seen right. every page, and you've gone over it ten times before it moves to the next step. Right, yeah. and you've given notes, and you and then it finally the the best way to find the typo is to look at it right out of the box from the printer and go. Oh, how did I miss that? So, anyway, yeah. so we talk about valuation, we talk about the preparation and the mechanics. Sure. And then when you're ready to go to market, and by the way, you have also worked out a list of uh, prospects, right? Who yeah. Are you gonna take, who you're gonna take this uh, company to, and you all, the other things that you're also working with a seller is how to tell the story, right? Because mm. you have to be able to. This is sales marketing. You have to be able mm-hmm. to sell the story of your company. Why are you so compelling? You know, blah, 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 blah. And then at some point, you create a document. Um, so the lingo is a SIM, C-I-M, a confidential information memorandum. So okay. that's the standard lingo in M&A. You create a SIM, which, t- which ultimate goal is to tell a story. That's what the SIM is for. Feel like this is the best small comic shop, bookstore, you know, publisher, etc., that you have ever met in your entire life. It's gonna make you lose weight and gain hair, you know. <laughs> and you, so you tell the story in that sim, and you back it up with all the details in a secure data room that that yeah. we control access. We literally control who can see it. And the data room will have everything. We'll have contract, tax return, financial statement payroll data, all the secret stuff, all the confidential stuff is in a private data room that we control access. And that's it. You know, I've heard about, you... I've actually been, I've been, you know, I've been close to a couple of deals like this, but never close yeah. enough to actually know the uh, answer to this question. When you say a confidential data room, is that just like a Dropbox? Like with a password or what? They are services out there. This is what they do. Oh, okay. Just this. The companies right. out there, yeah. There's Small Vault. There's One Hub. There's there's different companies. Okay. Similar similar to Dropbox, but the architecture is designed for, for this type of work. So, right. Yeah. Awesome. But, no, it's, yeah. That's yeah, right. Basically. So more robust. Yeah. So more robust than a Dropbox. Well, you kind of want to make sure, right? If your entire right. if your entire company. Uh, all your details are in one spot that it exactly, only, right. only the people you want looking at it will look at it. Um, so where are the, I mean, uh, so you've gone through that process and now you're out selling it. Uh, right. Let's say you have, you bring some parties to the table. Where are the big sticking points? Like what are the things that you usually are on the lookout for? Like, you know, early on, I assume that there are like little ripples that you know are going to become tidal waves if you're not careful. What are those? I mean, I might be asking you to give away the secret sauce here. No, that's actually a really good question. Very few yeah. people seem to ask that question. Um, one of the first thing I do is I actually interview the buyers. Why do you want to buy this company? Mm. Because their mm. reason tells me a really gives me a lot of information. Oh, we want to buy this company because our com- our our product is more toward male. We want to get more female content, or we want to get into this new category. Or our business is in Brazil, want to expand into Spain, whatever. You know, I'm, I'm yeah. obviously I am making stuff up, but usually they would tell me a reason why they're interested in acquiring my uh, client. And if they don't have a good reason, actually, I'm like, you might not be a serious buyer. Yeah, yeah. You might just be trying to get information, but there's going to be no commitment. Yeah. 
there's a lot of that, right? A lot of buyers sure. are not serious buyers. They go like, yeah, send me the sim, give me access to, the, give me access, you know, to the data room. I'll send an NDA, sure. Yeah. But I'm like, are you a serious buyer? Are you really, yeah. really, really going to buy, buy this company? So I ask a lot of questions. Why do you want to buy this? What are you going to do with the backlist? What are you going to do with the people? What are you going to do with the founder? Are you going to, are you, are you planning to make changes? So to answer your question, yeah, those kind of questions helped me from the very early in the process. It helped me figure out not only who's a serious buyer, but he also helped me understand supply and demand. That, mm. oh, you really need this, and I have this. So this is good. Oh, right. So, so, when, so another way of saying it is that you want something that I have. I have something that is looking for buyer. Sure. So let's not talk about that in, in, anymore. We're on the same page. You want it, and I want it. Yeah. Now, now let's how get to the details. Yeah. Right. Well, now let's talk about all the details. And the other, the second most important thing is everybody thinks about the price, right? Everybody thinks, about how much are you going to pay for it? That is sometimes the least important thing. It's really the structure. It's really the structure. Mm. I'm sure you heard about this all the yeah. time. Oh, yeah. buy your company for $10 million. But uh, $500,000 in cash, the other $9.5 million is in rolled over equity. It's going to be an earn out. It's going to go over seven years, which you might never see a dime. I'm going to yeah. fire you after two years. There's a million <laughs> details that is beyond just the initial price, which is all the detail, which boils down to one point. How does my client, the seller, how will she or he get paid and when? Mm. Oh, by the way, I got like 25 more questions, but I'm just giving you <laughs> one, give sure. you an, an, an example. Your checklist, but right, yeah. I yeah. have a checklist, which is during the process, like, okay, you're going to buy my company. How exactly does my client get paid? Yeah. And when will she or he get paid? Um, that's it's interesting. pretty important. Because it occurs to me that as you're talking to the buyer, you know, the buyer assume I assume the buyer goes in then knowing what they're in for in that conversation. And... So there's a dance there where they're trying to convince you that they're A, serious, but right. B, don't want it that bad. They'll be fine without it. But yes, we are serious about it, right? I mean, that's a, it's an interesting, um, just a dynamic, converse, conversational dynamic. Um, right. Uh, for, and the negotiation of there. That's, a, that's really interesting. Um, well, excellent. I, is there anything else? I mean, I don't want to... This, I don't want to get into business school, uh, you know, here at, at you know at the end of the day. It's been, we've already been going for a bit, but uh, are the what are the other pieces? Would you say are there any misconceptions about what you do? Anything that you uh, haven't? Um, any surprises that I mean, you've gone through this process dozens of times before you started this business. Are the things obviously you're you're curious and still learning? Like, what are the what are the big surprises now that you really focused on this? I wouldn't say surprises, but I would just, you know, uh, go back to the preparation. Preparation is everything. Yeah. Preparation is everything. If you're even thinking about selling your company and or if I represent the buyer, you're thinking about buying something to add to your business, um, do your homework, you know? Yeah. Do the preparation. Again, not, not just the financial. That's only a p small part of it. It's the people, it's the strategy, it's the expertise, you know, it's the fit, it's the culture. There's so many things. Again, I have a checklist. Uh, it's so many <laughs> things, but do the homework. Don't just be like, yeah, hey, can you sell my company tomorrow? Like, yeah, no, maybe nine months. Yeah. Let's let's put in the work. Let's yeah. meet every week, which is normally what we do. Let's meet every week, and every week I'm gonna give you homework. It's like, come back to me next Thursday and answer all these questions. And then we'll do it right. again and again and again. And it's daunting. And part of it is also emotional. So are you really ready to sell? Are you ready to put in the work? Right. And we haven't even talked about the single most important thing, which is the emotional aspect of selling your business that you build. Sure. And your entire identity is wrapped up in the company that you build. Um, it's a huge deal to sell it. Huge. Right. And uh, you're gonna go through an emotional roller coaster. What am I doing? <laughs> Why am I selling this? I don't want to sell. I don't want to work for anyone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm I'm certain I'm certain of that 
like, you know, I've gone through, you know, transitioning out of owning my own business. And, right. you know, yeah. for me, it was a completely different experience. But I can tell you, like, it is, you know, so much of your identity is in, wrapped up in that business. Like, it is, you, right. you are, you are that business and it is you. Um, yeah, I can, I can absolutely see that. Have you seen, have you gone down this process with people as uh, now that you're on the seller side where you go through all of that and they like either a come out of it stronger and ready to stay or like, uh, yeah, you know what, man, I'm, you're going to have to pry this out of my cold dead hands. Right. No, right? Yeah, yeah. I've, I'm, I'm sure there's always new surprises every day, but I've gone through many versions of, you know, of, you know, of the roller coaster. Yeah, and I also have to be a coach, right? I have to be a coach sure. and a therapist. I have to be able to talk to the seller, the the founder. Usually, it's the founder to be like, "Hey, you build this company. That is something to be very proud of. Now you have a perhaps once in a lifetime opportunity to put some money in your pocket. So mm -hmm. previously, you know, you took some money out, but so much of the money you made went back." into the company, right? You reinvest. Yeah. Now you have a one thing, literally one thing, a lifetime chance to put, I don't know, 1 million, 10 million, 100 million dollars in your pocket. You should do it. But understand that this company you build is not going to be someone else. Yeah. But be proud of it because you will forever be the company you started and built. That would never change. Yeah. But it, That's it, true. it is also no, it is also no longer yours. Yeah, no. Both of those things can be true, and I yeah. spent a lot of time talking, to, kind of talking people down, <laughs> <laughs> to really balance those two feelings. I'd be proud, yeah. and by the way, it's not yours. <laughs> oh man, when I go back to Brave New World in Santa Clarita, California, right. my friend Andy Legal is now running it, and it's so bittersweet. You know, right. it's like, right. oh, it's so he's still here, but. Why did you do that? What? 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 What is that? Yeah, no, right. Anyway. right. I, I feel that. I feel that deeply. Well, listen. Exactly. I there is one other thing I wanted to talk about before we're out. I think it's a really great way to segue out of uh, out of this section. But I know there's something that's really important to you and yes. has, has been very important to me as yes. well. Um, it's and what, I, yes, <laughs> uh, I saved it for the to, for the end because I knew it was like your dessert. So uh, I want to talk about Bink. Yay! Yeah. Found my notes. Um, so, so Bink. Um, yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Why don't you tell us? I, I won't. I, I'm. You know. I'm not. So I'm not Bing Foundation off. stands the. So Bing Foundation. The acronym stands for Book Industry Charitable Foundation. Um, we started. I don't know. 25, 26, 27 years ago. Uh, the Employee Emergency Assistance Fund for Borders. Um, oh. for, you know, for the employees that worked at Borders, and when Borders went bankrupt in whatever, 2007, 2008, 2009, those employees that ran the fund actually rechartered the mission and changed their, and changed their entire charter and became this full nonprofit um, to support people working um, in, to support people or owners and working for a bookstore. Yeah. And then I don't know exactly what year. At some point, they added comic shops. I don't know exactly what year that they, they added comic shop. So fast forward to, to today in 2024, Bing's core mission is to provide money for emergency assistance to owners and employees of a comic shop and bookstores. Full stop. Okay. That's what, what he does. So what does emergency assistance mean? Uh, what You cannot pay your medical bills. Um, your car broke down and you cannot get to work. Uh, the store closed because you was flooded. Um, you know, and blah blah blah. I mean, there's, there's a thousand reasons why you need from five hundred dollars to five thousand dollars. Right. Contact Bing. We give you money. That's it. That's it. The and secret you, is we. And the then you have to is, pay it back. And... <laughs> and then you pay it back with, uh, with exact LIBOR interest. Um, <laughs> the secret is we turn no one down. Whoa. Obviously, there's a process to sure. prove you are who you are. You're actually working a store, and yeah. what you ask for is real. Obviously, there's a process, and the process is anonymous. We turn no one down. That's incredible. You ask for help, 
we give it to you because if what we do, our job is to give money away. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, again, I told you about, you, you can see a pattern, you know, that I have a pattern of, you know, rather than the company interviewing me, I interview the company and I do sure. the same thing with Bing. When they asked me to join the board, I did a lot of research, like, because I've worked for non, because I've worked for nonprofit in the past and there's a lot of shitty nonprofit. I'm like, where did, I, where did all the money go? <laughs> yeah. So one of the first things I was considering joining Bink, I said, show me where the money goes. Show me where the money comes from and show me where it goes. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to tell me that 90% went to like GNA or something like that, then, you know, forget about it. Right. So to make a very long story, you know, obviously I joined Bink and it's like, oh, okay, money comes in, money goes out. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's do this. So that's the core mission. And there's other things that Bing does. So just just to give you one quick example, um, last year we launched a new program, which is mental health. So we now have a mental health program that you are owner or an employee of a comic shop or or you know or a bookstore, and you like to get some mental health you know mental health counseling mm -hmm. anonymously. We'll set you up and we pay for it. That's for incredible. Example. That's mm -hmm. incredible. That's wonderful. And there's That's, more, but I, I, yeah. I don't want to, you know, go through the entire laundry list of things we do. Listen, the important thing, you yeah, know, we have the core mission. I will say that, you know, being a comic book retailer was one of my favorite gigs. It was also one of the most emotionally and physically taxing things I'd ever done. Um, mm -hmm. And I can see like having an organization like that that is able to step in and not only help in, in times of real crisis, because right. every sh every shop I know has gone through those times of very real crisis where they're like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to open up tomorrow or next week or next month. Yeah. Right? And then you know? and then you also see patterns. Right. For example, um, right now we're seeing a clear pattern of people having trouble paying rent because rents sure. are going up. Right? Yeah. So, right. Am I right? So yeah. we see it. It's like the the, the, the data in <clears> life. You, you you read about it in the news and then we started getting calls like, I'm um, having trouble paying my rent next week. Yeah. Can I get two hundred bucks? You know, or you know, something. <laughs> something. I and we then have we, uh, we send the money. <laughs> one of our interviews was with uh Dimitrios uh, whose name, uh, last name, I'm not going to try. Of uh, anyone <laughs> comics here in Brooklyn, uh, ah, who yeah. literally just had to move. He had to move across the street because his rent went up like 20, yeah. percent right? Right. Partially because his business helped grow the block and helped his landlord like reevaluate, you know, what rent was going to be. Uh, right. He just couldn't make it. It wasn't feasible anymore. So he had to move across the street to a smaller location. Better, better traffic, but still, like it's yeah. a, it's an ongoing problem, you know, because a, a brick and mortar retail is is the most expensive real estate, right? It is just is, and, and dealing with that is is always an incredible problem, especially when you're a single owner. So right. Well, what, that's that's incredible. Can you talk about? Um, I don't want to put you on the spot but if you don't know have numbers mm -hmm. in front of you, but you, can you talk about like what ha you know since they since they've taken on comic shops, what has been. Uh, what has been the success rate? What has been like? How much? How much has gone out? How, how many have been helped? Do you have any of those numbers in front of you? We can delete this part out, by the way. Not no. I, I actually do not have it in front of me. I have all those data, but yeah. unfortunately, I don't have it in front of me. I can tell you that you know hundreds and hundreds of people being helped. I want to take a key point. The core mission of the nonprofit is help people, not sure. the stores. Sure. They have helped stores in the past as an emergency one-time thing during the pandemic. I think we did it okay. twice in the pandemic. Okay. But its core mission is to help the people. So okay, that's just good a, to know. a small distinction. Sure. But you know, millions of dollars have come in and out. Um, and quick note, where does the money come from? The money comes from donations, right? Coming from average people, coming from publishers, coming from company, coming from creators. Uh, I'm going to give a shout out to Jim Lee. Because um, Jim Lee, he did a sketch auction, and right. he actually raised over eight hundred thousand dollars for for the stores. Damn. Yeah. So, you know, but, but he's not the only one. There's other people. You know, Ted Adam gave you know like Dynamite, sure. you know, Nick. So lots of people help out. However, I will say that um, fundraising hit a peak in the pandemic because you okay. know, sometimes you see a need, you feel a need, you see the need. But since the pandemic is quote unquote over, fundraising has really dropped off, dropped off a lot, right? Because yeah. I think donor 
doesn't feel like we're in a crisis or there's an emergency. Sure. However, as you know, people's financial situation has actually gotten worse. Yeah. So Absolutely. even though there's no pandemic, the individual owners and employees of comic shops and bookstores, their finances are actually worse. Yeah. So I'm so I'm using this platform right now to be like, uh, we need money <laughs> because the money goes <laughs> out. But on the flip side, I'm also yeah. using this platform to speak to comic shop who are going to listen to this or people you're going to speak to, Adam, ask for help. So here's a really important data. 10 times more bookstore people ask for help than comic shops. To say it, to say it, to say it another way, for every person who owns or works in a comic shop that asks us for help, 10 people from a 10 people from a bookstore ask for help. I don't exactly know why. You know, we can speculate on the reasons, but it's a massive discrepancy. Something I aim to fix. In fact, I'm really bummed I couldn't go to Comics Pro. Because I actually want to spend a lot of time talking to comic shops. Like, why don't sure. you ask me for help? <laughs> well, I mean, they're at Comics Pro. Hopefully, these are not the guys who need the help. But, right. um, but um, I think that there's, I mean, it's, it's, that is really interesting. I mean, to put even another way, ten times more booksellers, people who work in bookshops, uh, received help because no That's one correct. is turned away, right? That's correct. So it was. I mean, so. Yeah, I, 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 that that alone, the fact that no one has turned away is is I think just uh, it's it's moving, it's incredible, it's really beautiful. Right. So wonderful. Well, I hope that that uh, if whatever whatever assistance this platform can give, right. and I and both of those sides is uh, I hope is my hope is uh, it will be influential in some way. So. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Well, I, you know, Ku, I swear to God, I have, I have sheets and sheets and notes and notes about your life. I feel like we dug deep. Um, I, I do have one uh, question, and it's one of those that I, I always, I, every time, I, it's one of those I've been pulling out of conversations, in conversations when I needed, like, just to kind of fill. But now, and now I'm really interested to hear what your answer is. And I'll close with it, I guess, unless it, unless the answer is lame, in which case we'll, we'll go back to the bank thing. Um <laughs> If you had to give a TED talk, right? We, we uh -huh. all know TED talks are all ubiquitous. You had to give a TED talk. It has nothing to do with business. It has nothing to do with comics. It has nothing to do with international. It has nothing to do with, say, networking. Nothing that right. you have built your career on. What I'm looking for is, like, who is, like, what is the thing that you are passionate about that we don't know about, right? What would that be? What was the thing that you're expert on that is not all that we've talked about tonight? I would talk about curiosity. I am a very curious person, and I find it very interesting that the conversation of nature versus nurture, right? You know, do you, I, I do believe curiosity can be taught. You know, I do believe that from a very young age on forward, we can help teach people say, ask questions, prepare, do your homework, learn about this stuff. Yeah. Um, but you have to start, but you, but you have to start with curiosity, because if you're not curious, then it's kind of rote learning, then it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> That's a beautiful place to start. So, uh, I you. I have to say, Ku, this is uh, I've been looking forward to this, and it has exceeded all of my expectations. <laughs> getting to know you over the years has been wonderful, and getting to know you tonight even better tonight has been a joy. So thank you so much, brother. I really do appreciate it. Well, thank um, before you. Before we I, leave, you know, yeah. No, no, please. Um, where can people find you on social media? And the rest of the internet, abroad. Like, how do, how do we find? How do we find Ku worldwide? Well, <clears throat> for business, uh, I'm very active on LinkedIn. You know, it's just under my name. So yeah. for business, um, my so you know my 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 Instagram, Blue Sky, my Threads, my <laughs> four thousand out of social. That's more personal stuff. Sure. There you find a lot about cats. A lot of food, a lot of travel, but not much business. Yeah. Um, and then, so, but LinkedIn is the best place for business, for comics, publishing, toys, games, okay. comic cons. <laughs> so. And uh, your website is? Coolworldwide.com. So. And um, if somebody wants to find Bink? 
you can Google Bink or Book Industry Charitable Foundation. So, mm -hmm. yeah. and by the way, that's so that's how you so that's how you apply. You know, if you wanna like you you want to ask for a grant, right? That's what that is. You want to ask for 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 money. Um, you can go to the website, email, call them, text them, you know, whatever. Like it, any which way, and <laughs> everything is private. But call us, please. Please. We want to give you money. <laughs> <laughs> and we will, uh, I'm determined we will have all of these links and everything in our show notes. So if you're, if you're just listening to this and you are in need of assistance, please, please reach out. Uh, please. There are plenty of, plenty of people who want to be helping you. There are plenty of people who see the value in what you do every day. Uh, many mm -hmm. of us have, you know, not left this industry our entire lives because, uh, because of how much value we see there. Well, thank you. Thank you, buddy. Once again, this is uh, Ku Yu Lang. Um, did I get that right? I've been saying it that way for years. Did I pronounce that right? Ah, close enough. Ah, whatever. Uh, my name is Adam Freeman, and uh, you've been listening to the Comics Industry Insi Insiders. Uh, don't forget to follow us on social media. Uh, all of that is also going to be in the links, and partially because I don't yet haven't yet memorized what those uh, tags are yet. So uh, <laughs> like and subscribe and... We'll talk to you next time. Thanks, buddy.